So there are a lot of new Tesla owners out there. I myself was one of them just a couple years ago, and I made a lot of mistakes along the way that have led me to a successful driving experience with my Tesla. And I see a lot of new owners making some of the same mistakes I did back when I bought my car. So here are some of the biggest mistakes I've seen with new owners, and hopefully this will help you out a little bit to avoid some of those mistakes. I wanna preface this by saying I'm not trying to call anybody out here. This is just things I've experienced and what has made me successful and saved me a little bit of money as well driving my Tesla. So first off is buying full self-driving. Now I've made a couple videos in the past about my thoughts on whether or not you should buy full self-driving, but in my experience, I really don't think it's worth the $10,000 cost right now to upgrade to full self-driving on a brand new Tesla. All Teslas come with standard auto autopilot with the purchase price of the car, so you are getting all of those basic autopilot features. Full self-driving just adds a couple more that can make it a little bit more convenient, but in my opinion, if you're switching from a car that just has cruise control, autopilot is gonna be an immense upgrade, and I think that $10,000 is probably better spent elsewhere. When I bought my car, I was looking at buying full self-driving, but when I did the analysis, Figured it was better to spend that money upgrading to a longer range Model 3 versus the standard range and not opting for full self-driving. Now along the way I have added Enhanced Autopilot, which I will say is a good purchase, but Tesla doesn't currently offer that. So I was able to get Enhanced Autopilot for $4,000, able to add Navigate on Autopilot, Summon, but honestly, the feature that I use most often is just auto lane change. That's been the most valuable feature out of that entire feature suite. And I think a lot of people that end up buying full self-driving, that's probably the feature they use most often as well. So I think with the features that are included in full self-driving right now, I don't really think it's worth it at that price. So second here is buying the full-blown Tesla wall connector. Currently it retails for around $500, and that is just for the charging unit. That is not the installation that uh, is needed to actually get it installed at your house. I think a lot of owners think that because you buy a Tesla, you have to buy the Tesla charging station, and that is not true at all. You could actually just install a higher amp outlet in your garage, and Tesla sells a $35 adapter for the mobile connector that's included with the car that can charge your car much faster than just using the wall outlet. This can definitely save you a lot of money because that cost of the charger is $500 where that money could be spent paying for the installation of that higher amp outlet versus paying for installation and a full-blown wall connector. So there are some differences between the wall connector and the mobile adapter that comes with the car. The wall connector is definitely gonna be faster in terms of charging your car, but honestly, that charge time doesn't really matter if you're just gonna be plugged in overnight. It's really a difference of whether you want your car to be finished charging in the middle of the night or in the morning right before you go to work. I did do a video on the NEMA 1450 installation and what's involved with that with my friend Daryl over at Nukem 384. So I will link that video down below. Number three is trusting autopilot too much. I think autopilot is a great tool, don't get me wrong, but I think it also makes some really bad mistakes sometimes and you've gotta be ready to take over at any time. So I've seen a lot of people using uh, ankle weights or different kind of anti-nag devices on their steering wheel to avoid autopilot telling them to keep their hands on the wheel. And I think that's really dangerous because autopilot is uh, a tool. You have to supervise it. It's not gonna completely drive the car by itself. So you need to be keeping constant attention. I know it's been great for me since I've owned my car, but I've also had some bad experiences of it slamming on the brakes randomly in the middle of the highway and I had to take over. And I also had an experience driving on a country road that didn't have the lane lines uh, it drawn very well. So it actually pulled off onto the side of the road and almost swerved us off the road. So definitely better to keep your hands on the wheel at all times, be ready to take over at any time because it can do things like that and you've gotta be ready for it. Number four is parking right next to somebody at a supercharger. So most of the superchargers out there actually split power between uh, like numbered stalls. So if you're in stall 3A and somebody pulls up and parks in 3B, 
those two stations are now gonna split power and you're gonna see your charge rate reduce. And you may have experienced this if you just bought a Tesla and were at a packed supercharger. There's not much you can do in that situation, but if you are pulling up to one that doesn't have a lot of people parked at it, try to leave some space from the person next to you so that power doesn't get split. Luckily, Tesla has gone to dedicated power cabinets and uh, dedicated charging for each station with their V3 superchargers. But for now, it is probably best to leave space anyway and be a considerate neighbor when you are charging your car. Number five is going along with the supercharger theme here, and that is charging all the way up to 100% at a supercharger. Personally, when I'm on the road, I do not like sitting at a supercharger for too long, and I only charge up as much as necessary to make it to my destination and usually leave about a 15% buffer. So when you're on the road, and you, especially if you're making multiple supercharging stops, it's not a good use of your time to charge all the way up every time you get to a new supercharger. It's best to just charge up enough to make it to your next supercharger and then get on the road and keep moving. There's a couple reasons for that. First off is just saving time when you're on the road. You don't wanna charge up more than necessary and waste time just sitting and charging your car. And the other reason is those last 20% or so of charging up your car actually take the longest in terms of charging speed. So your charging rate actually reduces over time as your charging is happening. Luckily, the built-in Tesla navigation is really good at estimating this as well. It'll say you have enough charge to continue your trip and you're good to unplug and continue driving. So I would definitely look for that message and make use of the built-in navigation on your car. Number seven is just understanding the entire charging landscape. So just because you own a Tesla does not mean you're locked into Tesla chargers. You can charge at other stations. Luckily on the road, there's a lot of superchargers out there. There's a pretty robust network. I usually lean pretty heavily on that when I'm traveling. Uh, but there's also a lot of level two chargers out there that are slower chargers, but can still get the job done if you're stopped and parked for a few hours or you're out to eat or something like that. And that is standardized. So most of those stations use the J1772 plug, which uh, an adapter came with the car to use these stations. So you can use non-Tesla level two stations. But on the DC fast charging, the level three side of things, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna get into all that right now, but just know that most of the time, your Tesla cannot charge at these stations. So I will link my EV charging 101 video down in the description if you wanna learn more about that and the other charging options that are out there. Number eight is driving too fast. And I'm not trying to be uh, a speed police here and tell you to slow down, but I will tell you that driving slower or driving around the speed limit is going to be most efficient, especially if you're on a long drive. So if you are used to going 80 miles per hour in the 70 mile per hour highway that you usually drive, it's not gonna be as efficient and you're gonna waste a lot more battery getting to where you're going than you probably would in your normal gas car. So it's important to understand that. I usually leave it at around the speed limit or five miles per hour over the speed limit to be most efficient. And that doesn't mean that you can't drive fast, you certainly can and just understand that it's gonna use more battery and make sure that you are planning for that and leaving a good buffer so that you're not arriving somewhere completely out of battery because you drove too fast. I was actually driving today and was running very low on battery and the car will actually tell you to keep it under a certain speed so that you can make it to your destination. So luckily the car is smart enough to tell you about that but it's best to just keep your speed at a reasonable level so that you aren't running out of battery or burning more than usual. Number nine is worrying too much about the miles remaining range display on the Tesla touchscreen and in the Tesla app. I think too many people get caught up in this number worrying that their car is losing a bunch of range or they're going through a lot of battery degradation or have issues with the battery or something like that. But I will tell you that over two years of living with my car, when I first bought it, it was showing 300 plus miles of range. And in the winter, it's dropped down to like 270 miles of range. But then in the summer, it bounces back up to 300. So it fluctuates all the time, depending on the environmental conditions, my driving style, 
just a lot of different factors that play into it. It's not completely based on the battery health. And honestly, I've gone as far as switching my car off of miles onto percentage mode. So I don't even see miles or miles remaining anymore when I'm driving. I look purely at percents and just look at how much percent I'm gonna arrive with, how much I'm leaving with, and plan my trip around that. I think the car uh, navigation is really good at estimating what percent you're gonna arrive with. And I like to use that as a gauge of if I need to stop the charge or not when I'm traveling somewhere. And last one here, number 10, is not waving at fellow Tesla owners. I always like waving to people, fellow Tesla drivers driving around the city here in Columbus. And I am not getting a lot of waves back anymore. I'm kind of upset about it, honestly. Uh, figured this would be a good platform to announce that to everybody and let everybody know that you need to wave back when somebody waves at you in your Tesla driving around. So hope to get some waves from all of you uh, if you see me driving around. And if I missed anything here, definitely let me know down in the comments below. I'm sure I did. Let me know what you've learned if you are a long-term Tesla owner and hopefully help out some fellow viewers here. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you driving around.